I want to offer a warm welcome to Doug Riggs. Back on the A Minute to Midnight show, I think we had you on the show a few times late last year. I don't know that you've been on at all this year, maybe I'm wrong, but it's nice to be talking to you again today, Doug. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, uh, Tony. Appreciate it. And it's a difficult subject we're going to be covering today, but I I kind of asked you if we could do this, uh, something I haven't covered for a while, and it is basically... um, satanic ritual abuse and DID and so maybe you could just give our listeners a bit of a brief uh, sort of intro into what your role in dealing with these things is. Okay Uh, well I began pastoring a church back in the early 80s and uh, working with uh, some of the people had some counseling uh, problems and issues and, and some of them weren't resolving and I didn't understand why you know, going through discipleship training and renouncing various uh, generational prayers and and discovered that um, after several years of kind of being stuck that uh, there was a, a trauma-based um, uh, disorder that I had heard about. And back then it was called multiple personality disorder. And uh, began reading on, up on that. And, and uh, the people that I was working with um, – they began to present these symptoms. They began to switch into different parts. Adults would be uh, having childhood parts. And when I began to observe this, um, uh, there wasn't much at that time written in, in terms of um, Christian literature. Uh, I read a book in 1991. It's titled um, Uncovering the Mystery of MPD by Dr. James Friesen, who is a Christian uh, psychologist. I read his book and um, and looked up the bibliography, and most of the um, the work or the citations were professional uh, people, MDs, that at that time had a history of working with multiple personality disorder. And so I began to collect these journals and read the professional literature. And and of course, uh, now anyone that works in this field, they they know that a person's identity, uh, when they're overwhelmed with uh, with trauma and neglect as little children. Their identity fragments, and uh, it's now been changed. The, the The definition is no longer called multiple personality disorder, but dissociative identity disorder, which was changed in 1994. So, I began, uh, you know, learning about how to work with this, and um, as I began to work with uh, people who had this uh, very severe disorder, uh, slowly and gradually, they began to get better and. And the dividedness and the conflict was uh, that, that kept them divided was able to be resolved. And <clears throat> everyone that I worked with, maybe there's one or two that that the people had a very chaotic and incest family background. But the majority of people I worked with, they grew up in families that um, uh, were generational. Uh, the children were subjected to sadistic ritual abuse. Uh, calculated to cause the identity to split and to program to demonize. So, you know, worked with uh, people here in our church and been, was asked by different churches across the United States to come and help because more and more and more was surfacing in the 90s. And so I just began to respond to those requests where people were seeking help. And, and now uh, here it is, uh, 2019, many years later. And um, that which was once very, not very much known in the church is widely known now. There are so many people working with it, um, and I'm very grateful uh, that, uh, that the church in many, not, not in every case, but um, there's more and more uh, awakening to this phenomenon, and people are able to get the help that they need. Okay, that's interesting. Now, I, I'm just... Um going to say, I've got a lot of questions to ask. Um, mm-hmm. First thing I just want to bring up is something that my my friend Matt, who also is part of A Minute to Midnight, my team, basically, he said to me in an email, I know he's listened to quite a bit of your stuff, and also Russ Dizdar, I think he's actually met Russ. Um, Matt said, you'd think that I would have come across some of this stuff having worked for 36 years in all areas of mental health. But I can say that I did not. I came across plenty of demonized people, but not any of the SRA stuff. So that's his perspective. What would your thoughts be on that? 
Well, I wouldn't know exactly uh, when he says he's worked in mental health to see what he's observed. Uh, has he given any diagnosis? Um, I wouldn't be able to respond unless I actually was able to interact with uh, Matt. Um, <clears throat> I can extrapolate that particular approach and uh, look at the the professional or the men mental health field. Uh, when Freud uh, actually changed uh, his particular perspective of an understanding of trauma-based disorders, and he went into Oedipal fantasies and and the whole diagnosis of multiple personality disorder, which was <clears throat> well documented by Jean Piget in France. Um, and then his protege, Dr. Morton Prince, wrote a book, The Disintegration of the Self, uh, the Multiple Personalities, released in 1906. Um, with this uh, shift with Freud, the whole diagnosis kind of went underground for many years. And, and it was one of the most mi misdiagnosed uh, disorders uh, they admit it was pr most predominantly to misdiagnosis schizophrenia. And then you have a person like Dr. Cornelia Wilbur, who uh, worked with Sybil for about 12 years. And um, she, her colleague said, you know, this is, you know, thought she was crazy. The, there's no such thing. And and she kept working with this person. And if, you, if people have ever seen the film Sybil, um, it's not necessarily an SRA background because that I don't think that was what was revealed in her case, but she's clearly a multiple. And um, as, as she worked with her in the 70s, there was a protege that uh, was uh, trained under Dr. Cornelia Wilbur. His name is Dr. Richard P. Cluft. These are MDs. They're, these are not Christians. These are professional people. And he began to discover it in his practice. And what he discovered is that the majority of people that were coming to him were misdiagnosed as schizophrenia. And these clinicians were not, they, just because they're a clinician, they miss the diagnosis. And so he began to um, do a lot of research and went through the files there where he was uh, working, I think it was in Pennsylvania, I forgot the hospital. But he had worked with over a thousand cases. In fact, he edited a book that was released in uh, 18, excuse me, 1986, uh, titled The Childhood Antecedents to Multiple Personality Disorder. And there's a series of monographs by MDs that he was the editor. And in there, he, um, he, he documented these cases of the medical doctors that uh, had worked with this, and they, they admitted that they missed the diagnosis uh, because they didn't understand the symptoms. And, you know, um, the mo like I said, the majority of the diagnosis was schizophrenia, and it wasn't. It said... Um, Dr. Frank Putnam, MD, the diagnosis and treatment of multiple personality disorder. Uh, he has a, a, a medical book on this. So there are many clinicians uh, all over the world that recognize this. And so if someone doesn't, um, uh, that is working in mental health field and they miss it, um, that's not unusual uh, because many of these medical doctors themselves admitted that uh, for years they missed it too because they, uh, were misdiagnosing misdiagnosing the, the disorder and they were putting other labels on it. By the way, one of the most common misdiagnoses in the European uh, um, part of the world is the borderline personality disorder. Um, and I've worked with some of these people that were diagnosed professionally borderline and they weren't borderline at all. They were full, they're full blown dissociative identity disorder. So it has to do with the clinician and um, uh, are they able to recognize uh, the etiology that is the source of of uh, childhood trauma, chronic childhood trauma, I should say. Okay, now well, we do see a lot of people coming out with, you know, sort of fairly well documented or, or not documented, fairly well publicised is a word I'm thinking of. Um, cases of this coming out and claiming all sorts of things and, and, and a who's who of names that they're supposedly abused by, you know, very high-level people and so on. And I have to say I'm sceptical. Um, uh, for a start, I think, well, how is it that this one person has been supposedly abused by so many high-level who's who names and, and, you know, so how can we know, how can we be sure these people's cases are genuine, not f either A, fabricated, or B, demon possession and false memories, or just someone who's plumb crazy 
can the yeah. memories be trusted? Well, there's there's a, there's, there's about four different le- le- levels of uh, response to your question. Uh, first of all, there's no there's no uh, uh, false memory syndrome. It's been clearly documented; it doesn't exist. False memory syndrome was uh, one of the founders, uh, Ralph Underweger, who was openly a pedophile and promoted pedophilia. And uh, the one of the original founders, they're no longer there. Um, uh, Peter and Pamela F- uh, Freyd. Uh, her her daughter, their daughter uh, Jennifer, uh, was abused by uh, her father. Wrote a book on it. She's now a psychologist, and they were one of the original uh, people at the false memory syndrome. And we now know that uh, it was a CIA front to, to try to cover up some of their disasters. But getting back to, uh, uh, I know I know who you're referring to. Uh, I won't give her full name, yeah. but. Uh, uh, it's it's public, so it's okay. It's Bryce Taylor. Yeah. Um, thanks yeah. for the memories. Um, <clears throat> when I read uh, some of her report, the very fact that she mentions that um, she's Rothschild, I already know that that's a, that's a, that is not a core memory. Um, that may be her, per, her current reality. Uh, some of the people she's mentioned, I have heard other uh, people report. But if if I if a, if and I haven't worked with her, but if a survivor like in different parts of the world, they're reporting uh, people that in high-level positions that have abused them. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about multiple survivors that, um, I say multiple survivors, many survivors that don't know each other, and they're reporting the same kind of abuse, the same people. That that core uh, testimony uh, has held up in courts of law. We, we have, there has been a prosecution uh, of of um, those that have been abused uh, through sadistic ritual abuse, I have well, there's six, so I think six states or so that have passed uh, ritual abuse laws. So, getting back to the particulars, if you have a person that's mentioning um, a particular individual that is a high-profile person, but you don't hear the majority of the others that uh, that are talking about this, that uh, Tony, that could be a screen memory. It could be a programming. Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily demon possession, <clears throat> but because of the dividedness, uh, if people are programmed, they can be programmed uh, to report the different people as uh, being involved in their lives. I have been reported as an abuser, personally, uh, of being in rituals. And uh, some of the people that are doing this work, um, uh, you know, they're, they, they report the kind of people that are doing the work that we're doing. But uh, I think the, you know, the short uh, response to that, if if I can even give it to you, is that, um, you know, the Word of God says, let every fact be established on the basis of two or three witnesses. If you hear these reports and there is some anomalous or something that is standing out that cannot be substantiated or is not reported by the whole community of survivors and, and others that are working with them, then I would put that on hold, and I would not necessarily take that as fact. Um, and so there are some reports of people that um, that I would question, especially if it's only coming from that individual. Okay, so it's like anything else uh, in a court of law. If you have uh, multiple witnesses, it's established as fact. And so the core of satanic ritual abuse, there there is no way that can be disputed. If, if there's a disputed, I'd say, well, we're, what's the agenda? What's going on there? Why is this being disputed? And why, why is it missed? Because it is well known by not only secular uh, people, uh, but many uh, pastors and counselors all over the world that are very much aware of this. I'll mention one person um, that comes to mind. Her name is um, uh, Ellen Lactor, L-A-C-T-E-R. I think she practices in uh, uh, Southern California. I have her on my website uh, under the SRIDID page. She's a PhD psychologist, and I'm, I don't think she's a professing Christian, but uh, she has so much documentation of her own history. Uh, Dr. Pam Mundy, who is a PhD psychologist, and she is a Christian. She's worked with this over 30 years. And uh, um, uh, a friend I'm working with now, uh, with one of her clients, uh, Dr. Holly Hector, who's Russ has interviewed Russ Dizdar, who works at uh, in in Denver. She's been working in this field for over uh, thirty years. So there are so many people, Tony, that 
There's a, the, the core reports of sadistic generational satanic ritual abuse is irrefutable. I I, th- I think for me, I don't doubt that it actually occurs. I just doubt some of the specific people's supposed memories and things. Like, for example, um, a- another thing that Matt says, uh, n- memories, like, are they all true? In a state of hypnosis, like drug-induced in- hypnosis, people can have false information implanted. Not everyone, he says, is susceptible or even able to be hypnotised. It only seems to work for a percentage of the population. But what about those people that have been in that situation and they're, you know, under drug-induced hypnosis, they've had memories or, you know, information planted that to them becomes a memory. What what are your thoughts on that? You know, could they be then spreading false information? Like, for example, say it is the CIA. I'm just giving, you know, off the top of my head. And they say, well, we want to implicate person X in all of these things so then they hypnotise and a few of the victims and they, and they put the same person in them so then person X shows up in several different people as being this guy's a bad guy um, but it's been planted an implanted memory what would your thoughts be on that well first of all I, I've been working in this uh, field as a pastor and been trained uh, in dealing with trauma based mind control uh, I've never heard of anyone that I know of uh, that I've worked with or worked under. Uh, I was trained with Dr. Jerry Mangadzi, who was, uh, got his Ph.D. Um, in counselor education, um, got his Th.D. at the Dallas Theological Seminary. I was trained under him. And no one that I know of has ever used drugs or hypnosis in working with uh, DID. No, no, uh, I'm so- not talking about them doing it. I'm talking about the people that have been programmed, like – but by the programmers, so that oh okay well yeah. no 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 absolutely yeah they they do they do use drugs they use do do use trauma, and you know for me it's very simple on how to get to the truth with these people and when I say simple, I don't mean it's 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 quick and um, it's not challenging especially if you're not you know, trained and know what to look for, but um, one of the verses that 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 you I really fixated on many years ago. It's Proverbs 20, verse 27. And it says that the spirit of man, and in the Hebrew, ruach, can be spirit or wind. But that particular word there uh, uh, in uh, Proverbs 20, 27, the, the spirit of man, that is the neshama, is the lamp of Yahweh, searching all the innermost parts of a man's being. I think Job 31, it says it's the center of understanding, it's the life source, I think, Job, Job 32. And uh, when uh, the creation of man, God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. The breath, that's neshama. So what I've learned through the years is that when you're working with a person that has all this, I mean, you can have scramble programming, you can have all, like what you just described, the use of drugs, and they do use drugs. Uh, during trauma, you got they're channeling in demons. Uh, I mean, that's all real. Um, and, and that is a part of, the, of, of what you have to deal with when you're dealing with trauma-based mind control. But for me, when I'm working with someone and, I, and these different compartmentalized uh, aspects of their identity, let's say there's demonic attachment or there's drug-induced states, um, that's not Nushama. The Nushama cannot be drugged. The Nushama is just exact means exactly what it says. It's the lamp of the Lord. The question is, is someone that someone is doing the work, do they know how to recognize this? And as I've learned to recognize and identify the function role and function of Nashama in the process, um, it's always 100 percent right. Because think about it. It says it's the lamp of the Lord, the lamp of Yahweh. It's in us, it's in every human being. And so all the deception and, and that is there and is purposely put in, there's all kinds of deception. In, and uh, Tony, the, the number one person that the trauma-based mind control is, is directed against to deceive is the victim themselves. Mm-hmm. So that they're not even able to know what is put in and they're so weaponized that their presenter person, they don't even know what's there. So they can go into a church, have a program si- assignment, I mean, anybody could look up um, Russ Dizdar's two-part series on um, uh, the uh, 
um, what is it, cult, the occult infiltration of churches. I think he's got a two-part series, which is a tremendous thing. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, all that's there, but that the, you just described I mean, when it comes to programming. In fact, I think it was a book I read years ago. I can't remember the name. In 1978, there were just short of over 200 drugs that the CIA used uh, to, in terms of uh, uh, MK Ultra uh, mind control. So that, that is real. But for me, and what, when, and you got to look at the fruit. If there's no fruit in what you're doing, then you, then there's something wrong. We have people that are fully integrated, and uh, for, say for example, they come up with uh, what I call a screen memory, which is designed to deflect you from something deeper. Um, and they, and, and, and the presenter, when they begin to hear things coming out of them, the the biggest skeptic with most people are the presenter themselves. How can this be true? They, I mean, they're in denial. And I said, don't worry about it. So when I hear an anecdotal uh, aspect of a person's journey in a particular session, and then I hear something in the next session is contradictory, and and you know who's most upset? The people you're working with. How can I believe this? I got this part of me saying this. I got another part of me come out saying this. You know what I tell them, Tony? I said, hey, look, you just be patient. We're going to continue to do the work. And when you're I'd, the fragmentation and the compartmentalization of your identity, when it comes together, it's going to sort out and it'll be your history and you're going to know the truth. And Tony, I've never found an exception to that. Okay, well, that, yeah, that's good, interesting, good points. So now what about when the people do claim to be, particularly if they're claiming high-level names, you know, who's who type names, is it possible to pinpoint those people uh, in terms of having really known the person that they claim to have known or to have been in the spe- you know, specific place? Um, is there any physical or circumstantial evidence to back up their claims or do you just take it based on the memories that you uncover? Well, you're talking about physical claims. When you're working with someone who's uh, traumatized and if you were to say, well, they're reporting this person. Uh, well, we need to go see if we can get the, let's say they're a high level person, a high profile person. We need to go get their DNA. Anyone that's working with a, a person who's DID, that's not going to help them. So I personally don't care who they're reporting. I What I look for is the symptomatology of trauma. I'm there to help them reconnect with their life, reclaim their life that's been destroyed. And if I have, and I've worked with a number of people in you know, throughout Europe and South Africa and throughout the United States and, uh, and uh, Australia. Um, when they are reporting people in high-level uh, positions from different parts of the world and they describe the circumstances as similar without even knowing each other, that meets the biblical criteria of fact. Okay, so that, but to me, the anecdotal um, testimony is is not what I'm there for when I'm working with people who are have serious problems. They're sometimes are suicidal. Uh, their life is in chaos. My responsibility is to help that person get well. Now, in when I'm listening to the anecdotal testimony of these people, I don't get caught up in their narrative. And every professional person that I've talked to, they don't. When they're sitting in front of a person who is telling their story. They're not there to judge what's true or not. They're there to help that person work through their trauma. And if whatever the narrative is, their anecdotal testimony is, work with a person. What does this mean to you? Is there is there any evidence of trauma there? And work with the trauma and help that person resolve those issues and come to integration and come to wholeness and have a meaningful life. So I, I you know, when it comes now, with you, you know, anecdotal testimony. Do I do I have a, um, uh, reports of people uh, being abused by high level politicians? Absolutely, and I believe them because you look you you look at some of these people, and uh, it wouldn't it should, wouldn't surprise uh, any of us if we want to know well okay deep state what is deep state? Did anybody believe there's things going on behind the scenes behind governments? You get behind the scenes and behind the, that which is the visible political system, and there's absolutely a deep state, and it is a, it is a Luciferian satanic agenda, and it is operating 
Uh, and how do we know that? The Bible tells us the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, 1 John five nineteen, And I take that as fact. Yep, agreed. Now, so that brings me to the next point then. So the satanic ritual abuse mind controllers, what are they ultimately trying to achieve through this? Is it uh, a new world order, for example, or is it personal power for themselves? Or is it, you know, what is their core motivation for this? Well, you have various levels. Um, uh, as an example, if you look at Ezekiel 28, we see the Prince of Tyre in the first uh, uh, 10 verses. The Prince of Tyre, he's acting as if he's a god. And um, he's proud, he's arrogant, he's lifted up, but he's the Prince of Tyre. He's Ethbaal III, you know, he's a descendant of Je Jezebel's bloodline. All right, you read that profile of that individual there, okay? And then it shifts from the prince of Tyre to the king of Tyre in uh, Ezekiel 20 and 11. When you look at the, uh, the, uh, the king of Tyre, we see that behind this prince of Tyre is the king. And who is, who is that? That's clearly the anointed cherub. That's Satan himself. So does the prince of Tyre know that he's being energized and he's manifesting the character of Satan? I don't think so at all. I think he just thinks he's top dog. He's just... You know, he's uh, arrogant and, and uh, thinks he's a god. Okay, let's, let's bring it over in the area of, of how Satan operates in trauma-based mind control. Take, for example, Mengele. Mengele was, um, was a pioneer in trauma-based mind control. Uh, he was very proud for him to bring in the eugenics. In other words, to be uh, the master uh, uh, engineer, if you will, in terms of psychological abuse and spiritual abuse. Uh, he, he was serving his master, Hitler. And to become effective, uh, he would experiment with people, do twinning, fragment their identity. Uh, of course, he killed a lot of people in the process. But the ultimate goal was, uh, Hitler's goal was to, um, to infiltrate the church, uh, to destroy the church, because he saw the church as the, 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 one of the primary reasons why he, he failed in his bid for the Third Reich. He thought he could, by taking out all the Jews, uh, that that would cleanse the blood and that would give him power and right uh, to, to establish his Third Reich. Uh, but he lost. And so I, you know, I personally believe that Satan put into his mind um, that it, it was the church. And a lot of, in a lot of reasons, he, he's right, because uh, the confessional church and people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer they were uh, dedicated to take out Hitler, I mean, as, as churchmen. So we have multiple layers here. In other words, you have a human agenda. The human agenda uh, with some of uh, these people, they're sexual, per they're all pedophiles. So they have sexual perversion. Um, it is power because when they're, when they're doing the trauma-based uh, uh, mind control, they're not only doing trauma, but they're functioning as sorcerers there's an elation, there's a huge charge, they're doing rituals, and the whole atmosphere gets charged. There's, uh, when you have a sexual uh, a ritual abuse, you have uh, orgiastic activity. Uh, that's found all through, I mean, I have my, in my file all the scriptures, in the, especially the Old Testament, on child sacrifice and, and ritual abuse and that kind of thing. So it's a, it's a multi-level thing, and what Satan does, he... If, if, if someone's operating, operating in the flesh and they want power, they want to have uh, control, they want to satisfy their lusts, he's right there to empower them. But what is he doing? Why? And, and this, is a, this is a question people need to think about. How is it that everyone that has ever come to me in the 30 plus years, 100% of our all Christians, they're not unbelievers. Mm. So the satanic agenda is to capture a little child, capture their mind at the earliest age, weaponize them with assignments to go into the church so the presenter person is completely ignorant, and they go into the church to take down pastors, to go into the nurseries, switch, program children. And this is not theory. I mean, I've, I've, I've worked with this stuff. I mean, I, this, this is what they do. And the presenter person is amnesic. Um, so what would be the satanic agenda there? To corrupt, to infiltrate, 
uh, to weaken the church. Well, the programmers, they're just, they're there to fulfill their own ego, to gain power. They get uh, uh, as many children as they want uh, to carry out their their uh, morbid and sadistic pedophilia uh, mindset and their modus operandi. So, yeah, as long as there's flesh, the enemy can work, but the enemy's ultimate agenda is to, is to infiltrate the church, to weaken it, so that uh, it, it doesn't represent a threat to his kingdom. Interesting, because I've, of course, interviewed Karen, Cal and Hamlet a few times, and both her and her mother, they were programmed to infiltrate churches. Uh, and yes. to bring occultism into the churches. So, yes, you know, I'm sure she would agree totally with that. Now, I, I'm just wondering how much is uh, Crowleyism, Alistair Crowley and the teachings of Crowley influential in the satanic ritual abuse stuff? You know, we know Crowley said that do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And, you know, he wrote several books. And, I mean, he's just a terrible man, really. Yes. Um and and we've seen you know Jimmy Page owning yeah. Alistair Crowley's house and you know and a lot of Crowleyism. In fact, um, Physical Graffiti, the Led Zeppelin album, had a picture of Crowley in one of the windows. I think Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band Beatles album had Crowley in. So there's a whole lot of Crowley sort of influence, um, which to me is just bizarre. The uh, the yeah. fact that this terrible man has had such an influence in the entertainment industry and all that is there a link? Do you think w with Crowley teachings to what's going on? Well, I, when it comes to working with SRIDID, that is satanic ritual abuse, and it's dis the disorder that's created dissociative identity disorder. I haven't found uh, anyone in particular that was a follower of Crowley. Although the ideology of Crowley and the ideology of the Luciferian elite is very much related, but it's not because of Crowley. It's because the very the satanic spirit that energized Crowley, and those that are uh, the the same satanic mindset that is operating in the uh, the elite, uh, is the same. So their mode of thinking, their ways, you know, the rebellion, do as thou wilt. It's it's. Whether they know Crowley or not, their MO is the same because they're operating under the same spirit. I think the way to understand that is look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Uh, when you, I'll just read it. Uh, I mentioned 1 John 5, 19 when John says the whole world lies literally in the, in the sphere of the evil one. That's the literal translation, in the sphere of the evil one. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 um, uh, is number two one you uh, the saints of Ephesus uh, and those that would read this epistle you were dead in your trespasses and sins so dead means you're solically alive you're physically alive but your spirit is dead but you still have a spirit it's just dead that dead spirit is com has complete affinity with the prince of the power of the air okay you're once dead in which you formerly walked, that is, you ordered your life according to the course of this world, that is, the age of this world, the Germans would say zeitgeist, according to the prince of the power of the air. That's lower atmosphere. Notice this, of the spirit singular that is now working, energia, supernaturally energizing the sons of disobedience. So there's a spirit singular who's referred to as the prince of power of the air, that the word working is energizing the sons of disobedience. So the sons of disobedience, they may be atheists. They may not even believe in the devil. That suits him fine. They're still completely agents whereby he carries out his supernatural work. And so when a person is dead and they're not born again, Satan has access to them to whatever degree they've given themselves over to the sins of the flesh and they've given themselves over to gaining power. You remember in Luke chapter 4 when uh, uh, Satan uh, uh, approached Jesus and, and what did he offer him? And I'm not going to read the whole passage, but it's very enlightening. Uh, when Satan approached Jesus uh, there in, in Luke's account, um, he says, uh, in the second temptation here in Luke's account, 
Um, in Luke 4, 5, he says, And he, uh, Satan, led him, Jesus, up and showed him all the kingdoms of, of, of the world, the inhabited earth, is what the Greek says. Um, in a moment of time, can you imagine that? That's like a time warp. Yeah. In a moment of time, and the devil said to him, I will give you all this legal jurisdiction, this exousia, this domain, and its glory, for it has been handed over to me. Who handed it over to him? Adam. God gave him dominion, and he forfeited the dominion. It has been handed over to me, the kingdoms of the world and their glory. It was meant for Adam. He forfeited it. It's been given to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Who's he going to give it to? Look at the next verse. Therefore, if you will worship me, it shall all be yours. So you want you someone that's lusting after power, massive wealth. I can I'll name one person that's been my nemesis for many not anymore. He's old and pretty old now. Is Prince Philip? I have people all across the world I work with that he has been used as a as a handler to tra- to sexually train these uh, these women, and these girls didn't even know each other. So you say, well, Prince Philip, I mean, he's, he's the, well, who is he? In, in 1998 or 1997, I, wrote, I read an article, uh, I think it's called the Executive Intelligence Re- uh, Review. They estimated his wealth at that time as $9 trillion. That's 9000000000 billion. Mm-hmm. Where, where did he get that? If you bow down and worship me, it's all yours. So anyone that wants wealth, they want uh, power, they want anything that will fulfill the lust of the flesh. They sell their souls to the devil. He's going to give it to them. And you see that going on massively in Hollywood. It's happening in Hollywood. How do these people become? And I've worked with a number of people that have been in rituals with people in Hollywood. I worked with one of the uh, uh, daughters uh, and a daughter's sisters of a well-known actress who's full-blown uh, uh, SRADID. So you know, it's if the if, if if there if there's a veil over the hearts of those who do not believe, Second Corinthians chapter three. If the God of this age, Second Corinthians four four, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, then what can He do with those that will sell their soul and and if they'll worship Satan, just like when Satan approached Jesus, he's he's lust for worship. And if he can find worshipers, he's going to give them what they want. But there's a hook it's going to cost in their soul. Yes, I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned Prince Philip because a lot of people, of course, tie the royal family in with this sort of stuff. And um, I had somebody send me um, information about their life with the royals and so on, this is last year sometime uh, in Scotland. She's from Scotland. And, um, well, she was able to substantiate it really by sending me a photo of her and her ex-husband with the royals. So she wasn't making up, you know, a story that was some far-fetched story that she had no connection with them because there she was. But, um, you know, that in that sort of situation, it's, well, I, to me, it was too dangerous. I felt it was getting too dangerous to really get involved in because there were just names being put out there that I was thinking I could be endangering all of us, um, which is a tricky part in all of this sort of thing. When you start naming a lot of high-profile peoples, does that not then leave you as a potential target? Oh, I've been I've been had all kinds of threats. I could I, I, if I could give you you know one thirty minutes and give you. Item after item where assassins have been sent to me. Uh, I've had calls and I, and I mock them. I said, go ahead. You want, I mean, I've had threats. I said, here's my address. Come on, show up. I'll find out who your God is. Yep. yep. I, I said, you know what? I'm going to tell you something about your God. He's a coward. And you know what? If you don't give the enemy fear, he doesn't have any power over you. And Tony, I don't have any fear of the enemy. And that's why, that's not the main reason why I'm here. I'm here because Psalm 91, Psalm 27, because I know who my God is. And um, I, he's numbered my days, not some loser going to the lake of fire. 
And so I'm just bold. And uh, what I found, uh, I mean, I'll just give you, I mean, I could give you many. There was one uh, uh, the super soldier. This, uh, he was a young kid. He was in our church. Ab- so demonized, full-blown SRADID. He would just shake and glare. His eyes would turn black. And one time we were uh, meeting with a bunch of people, and he switched into a very angry. I mean, his eyes went black. He had a he had a knife that would just flip out, and he and he was really it was so sharp that you could just cut a paper without even slicing. He was right in my face, and uh, and and he was and he was just grimacing, you know. And uh, and I, I didn't have any fear, but uh, I just said, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of my face. He never moved. And the reason why he didn't move, he was demonized, but there was humanity there. And when you're dealing with humanity, spiritual warfare doesn't work with the humanity part. And so the next thing I did, I said, I told him I didn't care. I was ready to go home and be with him anyway. I, you know, I mean, all this darkness. I mean, who wants to hang around here any longer than <laughs> necessary? Mm. So I just looked at him. I said, I, all I did, I said, I call upon you, Lord Jesus Christ, to be glorified in this situation. And when I said that, I said, I just call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be glorified. You choose. You want me to go home? I'm fine. I'm ready. And, and Tony, all I remember is he was in my face. I prayed that prayer. And without me blinking, I didn't see him move. He was 20 feet away from me and completely subdued. And I never saw him move. Mm, wow. That's amazing. That's what angels do. Yeah. Yeah. Look at Psalm one. Uh, look at Psalm one hundred three, verses nineteen through twenty-two. Look at look at Elijah and his servant. I mean, they were surrounded by these Syrian armies, and he says, "Open the eyes of my servant, Lord, and let him see." And and what do you see? Horses and chariots surrounding the enemy. Greater are they, and, and what did Elijah say? Greater are they that that are with us than that are with them. That's a fact. So, uh, you know, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, are not they angels, uh, ministering servants sent forth uh, to be uh, ministers to those who are heirs of salvation? I take that literally. And I know that I'm still here today. And I, and I, you know, I don't care who is threatening me or I'll go into any particular place where this is going on. And, and I've never, ever seen a threat carried out against me that re- represents a loss of life of anyone that I've worked with, or they're threatened if they keep doing the work, they're going to, all these things are going to happen. I say, they're bluffing you. Let's keep doing the work and uh, we'll pray around this and you watch. And I've never lost one person I've worked with. And, 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 and the majority, Tony, that I've worked with have come out of Royal bloodlines. Mm, that's interesting. Now, if there are anyone, any people listening that think that, you know, hey, we are in this situation, we need help, what would, what should they do? <laughs> well, everyone has their own um, story and their own background and their own needs. Uh, first thing you do, you really cry out to the Lord. You, you go to the book of Psalms and you notice the Psalms, David and sons of Korah and uh, Ethan, the different ones that are writing. They'll cry out to the Lord in their distress. They'll cry out in their Lord. Uh, the, David was had life-threatening situations. He cried out to the Lord. And what do you? What's the testimony? The Lord heard me and delivered me. So you learn to cry out to the Lord. You cry out to the Lord, and then if if you need specific ministry or help, um, you know there are. You know I can't. You know I don't recommend names of people, but I do on my website under the counseling page, you know, Deeper Walk International, uh, people can go there and, and, and get resources and find counselors that will help them. Uh, but Tony, there are so many seeking help that there are not enough workers. And so for me, what I, what I'm doing now, I can't answer all the requests. I get requests all the time for help. I, I can only work with those that already have a counselor or a, a pastor and uh, help train them to work with their clients. And when I and and I'm talking and I'm I'm referring to also those who are uh, trained therapists who are have their PhDs. Just because they have a PhD, that doesn't mean they understand how to, how to actually identify and get to core. They need to, they need to learn because they're not they don't learn this in graduate school. So what I'm saying is that 
the, my particular efforts at this time, I'm 74 years old, okay, so I can't be filling up a um, itinerary working with people, is to train those that are already counselors or pastors or psychologists so the work can be multiplied and they can do the work with the people that they're working with. So if those people are seeking help, you you pray that God bring you a Christian pastor or have a counseling ministry uh, that would help you. And uh, I'm a, I wouldn't guarantee, but depending on the situation uh, and the local church or the, the counselor, um, I, I would prayerfully consider doing the training work. But um, I do not do personal counseling anymore because if I did, I wouldn't even be talking with you here tonight. I'd been... You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't. I, I, my wife would be a, a widow. I wouldn't <laughs> yeah. have any time. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, um, if people do want to find your website, do you want to tell them it now? Oh, that's fine. Yes, it's uh, dougriggs.org, and um, uh, it's the, there's the ministry page. Our homepage gives a little background of who we are. Our primary uh, emphasis is, uh, you know, our ministry page. This is our assembly times and our teaching times. I have an interview page where I've had a, a number of interviews through the years like yours that are posted on there. I think we've done, what, three interviews before today? I think this is the fourth one. So Thank on you. the interview page, we have our interviews on there. Um, at the SRIDID page, we have, uh, uh, we're talking about this kind of subject and uh, various resources. Uh, the teaching page, we have different uh, uh, different articles that we have posted. And on the video page, uh, we have uh, messages that have been put into PowerPoint uh, to help people understand the spiritual warfare, to understand uh, key uh, biblical principles uh, like what is the church and um, uh, uh, the celestial court. I mean, why did God allow uh, you know people to be ritually abused and the horrific things to happen to little children? Well, I, I seek to go through that in the Celestial Court series uh, because these are really legitimate questions. So as a pastor, the overall framework is is to equip God's people. And the SRIDID is a subset. It's like a missionary arm of who we are as Morningstar. Okay, that's cool. Now, um, before we close out, have you got any other things that you would want our listeners to, to hear? And, and maybe you could even pray for our listeners too. Uh, well, sure. I, you know, it, it, for a follow-up to what we're talking about, I think I mentioned to you before we went on the program, if the people go to the SRADID page, that's, that's Satanic Ritual Abuse slash uh, uh, DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder, uh, right there towards the top, there's an interview with Wilford Wong. Uh, I had a 45-minute talk with him. He's in the UK. He's been working with... Um, uh, sadistic and satanic ritual abuse for over 26 years there in the UK. And he uh, works with the high level people that in the, in the government and um, Scotland Yard uh, to uncover this. And there's a huge effort to, to squelch this and to keep it hidden. So why? Well, if you listen to Wilford Wong's um, uh, lecture there, it's about an hour, uh, he's interviewed by a man that was a former Scotland Yard. It will give you j just a, a, a framework of of just how uh, you know pervasive pervasive this is. Uh, so uh, I don't know if that answers your your question, but uh, uh, I tried it on the SRADID page to, uh, to post those uh, kind of uh, resources that will help people understand what we're dealing with. We have. The seminars that we have given, our last seminar that we did was in Hawaii. Uh, that's 12 um, uh, sessions. Uh, and and that gives the kind of the framework of what we do in, in identifying and working with SRDID. Cool. Now, Matt, perhaps we, um, you could close out by praying for our listeners. Oh, Father God, you know that uh, you have a specific plan in these last days. You have... You've made a place and a choice in your sovereignty to allow the enemy out on a very long leash. And what you've chosen to, to allow him to do, we know you hate it, but for reasons uh, that only known to yourself, that you're going to justify 
every choice that you made, you're going to be glorified. So I pray for those that are struggling with uh, any any form of abuse and uh, trauma-based mind control, that I, I would pray they would be encouraged uh, if they would be led to re- to go through the vi- on the video page to l- listen to the celestial court that you're going to use people that have been severely abused as your weapons and i pray for everyone that's been abused that god has chosen you if you have gone through severe abuse he's chosen you to become a candidate as a weapon in his hand to completely overthrow the satanic kingdom it is written, 1 Corinthians 6, 2, Do you not know that you will judge angels? Or do you, or you do you not know that you will judge the world? And do you not know that you will judge angels? S- but that requires qualification. So I pray for everyone that has had severe suffering, uh, any kind of uh, ritual abuse or any kind of abuse, that, Father, you would encourage them. Uh, you would, re- Lord Jesus, you would reveal who Abba Father is to them. And you would release your elect angels to provide a covering and protection. And, Father, you'd open up the door to those resources, godly resources, trained re- people who are equipped to deal with this, to give them the help and uh, the ministry they need uh, to become, um, to be able to stand s- strong in the Lord and the strength of your might. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, Doug. Just one more time before we go, just tell the listeners your website. Uh, it's DougRiggs.org. Excellent. Well, uh, it's been a, a very interesting discussion, and I hope it'll um, give some clarity to other questions that people might have had, probably similar questions to what I've had. So I hope this has helped to clarify some of that. Yes. You mentioned a friend of yours, Matt, if you'd ever like to have a chat, just you and uh, him together. I uh, need any clarification, I'd be happy to, uh, to visit if he's uh, if you would like to. Okay, I'll mention that to him. Well, he'll no doubt hear that on here anyway. So, okay. All right. <laughs> great. Thank you, you, Doug. All right, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, Tony. Bye-bye. Bye. Folks, you can find all of our shows on our website, a minute to midnight.com. You can also find them on iTunes and on YouTube. All the music used in the shows is written played and recorded by me you can download that on our website too if you want and you can donate there if you want to help a minute to midnight as well you can donate on the website too that's it for this show hope you enjoyed it hope it helped with some answering of questions and we will be back with another show hopefully in a few days time god bless and have a great week we'll catch you again soon